Okay, everyone, we're going to get started here. Uh, just before we get going, uh, can I please ask you to mute your microphones just to avoid the background noise? So welcome all MHA presidents, directors, coordinators, and coaches to tonight's development webinar presented by SGI Canada. Tonight, we are excited to bring you this webinar on growing female leadership in hockey with special guest, Mel Davidson. Just so you know, this webinar is being recorded. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Matt Miller. I am the Senior Coordinator of Hockey Development Grassroots for the Saskatchewan Hockey Association. I will be the acting host for tonight's webinar. I now would like to introduce some of our special guests. First, our guest speaker, Mel Davidson. Mel began coaching her brother's hockey team in 1978 in Oyen, Alberta. From that, spent 40 plus years of involvement as a volunteer administrator, scout, coach, general manager, and consultant. Her time in the game has included U7 through to U18, from AAA to Junior A, Junior B, and various levels of women's hockey. Mel was also involved in five Olympic Games with the Canadian National Women's Hockey Team, three as a coach. In those five Olympic Games, Team Canada brought home four gold and one silver. Mm. In addition, Mel has coached at the NCAA level with Connecticut College and Cornell University. She is currently employed by Own the Podium as a high performance advisor and as a consultant for the Western Hockey League's Winnipeg Ice. Her role in the Olympics earned her various honors, including being inducted into the Alberta Sports Hall of Fame, Alberta Hockey Hall of Fame, and the Canadian Olympic Hall of Fame. In 2010, Mel was awarded the Jack Donahue Coach of the Year Award and named to the Canadian Association for the Advancement of Women and Sport and Physical Activities Most Influential Women list. Thanks for being with us tonight, Mel. Now I will introduce our four SHA Master Coaches from Shelbrook, Brenda Cromarty, from Regina, Dina Jelena and Colleen Sistorix, and from Saskatoon, Robin Ulrich. I would also like to take this time to acknowledge Sarah Hodges and her Women in Hockey Network group. Thank you ladies for being with us this evening. Now I would like to introduce our SHA office staff and board. From the staff, we have Blaine Stork, who is our Senior Coordinator of Hockey Development Coaching, and Joel Hausman, who is our Senior Coordinator of Hockey Development High Performance. And Joel LaPrairie, who is our Manager of Marketing and Communications. From the SHA board, we have our chairperson, Tim Hubick, and one of our officers, Edward Watson. So how this is going to work tonight, everyone, Mel has a 20 minute presentation. Then we will get into questions or comments regarding Mel's presentation. Then we will split you into a breakout room. You'll get it into a breakout room exercise. And then to end it, we will have 10, 15 minutes uh, to discuss the answers from each of your breakout rooms. Hopefully that takes us to roughly an hour. Okay, well, enough of me talking. Mel, it's all yours to get this started. Thanks, Matt. You think it was my first time on Zoom today, uh, considering I've been on for eight hours, I couldn't find my unmute button. Um, anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's terrific to be here. Thanks a lot for, for the invite and for having me. Um, you know, it's uh, growing female leadership and seeing the female game grow is really important for me. I've spent a lot of time in the game and, uh, you know, some days I feel like the game's advanced significantly and other days I wonder uh, why I even stay involved. So uh, I have different, uh, different levels of emotions about it on a, on a daily basis. I'm, uh, I'm guessing all of you are here because of an interest, maybe uh, uh, wanting to counter something or maybe just uh, hopefully here as support and, and wanting to grow the, grow the female leadership within Saskatchewan, within our country. Uh, but most of all, I, I'm gonna make the assumption that every one of you on this call either has, has or has had a female or a woman or a young girl in your life um, that you want to see the best for. 
that you, whether it's a daughter, your mom, a partner, your sister, uh, the next door neighbor's kid, whatever it might be, that you have a, a female, a woman in your, in your circle that is, is or could be affected by the decisions that are made in sport and the lack of or the abundance of opportunities uh, for them as they continue to grow and, and, uh, and evolve as, as young people. So as Matt said, I have a few slides, about eight slides. I'm just gonna talk through them. Uh, they're, really met, they're really brought about from my experiences, really. Um, I, they're not, uh, it's, it's, a lot aren't fact-based. A lot, some, some have some facts to them, but it's really just what I've encountered over time, what I've observed um, and what I've experienced. And some of it has been really shitty and some of it has been, uh, been outstanding. So I'm gonna uh, share my screen here. It usually takes me a few minutes uh, or a few seconds to get that taken care of. And then I'm gonna walk through uh, my slides and, and then uh, open it up to questions. So bear with me for a second uh, because it always does this to me. One more time. All right, can everybody see that? Stubby, you can give me a thumbs up, we're good. All right, so you know when I looked at the CHA logo and I and I saw the I'm not exactly sure the if it's a tagline, a theme, a vision. You know, I thought what an outstanding piece to go with the logo, shaping character for life. It's more than a game. And then when you look at this topic of of growing female leadership, you know, it is about shaping character, shaping people for life, um, inclusion, and and making it about more than just one piece of, of society and it's more than a game the things that we can do and, and what we can grow in hockey and how we can develop strong citizens for for the for society for our country you know hockey should and does lead the way in that area so i, I you know I, I congratulate the sha just on that tagline and i apologize if i don't have the right title right but you know what a, what a great piece to accompany your logo and then, you know, when you look at this picture, like, is she looking sideways or is she looking forwards? And I think depending on how you look at it, there's a different perception there. There's a different perspective. And I understand that everybody uh, on this Zoom call, including myself, is on any given day would see her looking sideways, would see her looking forward. And it's just, a, you know, we have different ways of looking at things and the importance of it is to keep our minds open enough to see things through other people's eyes and to even walk a mile in other people's shoes. There's the, I forget which fundraiser it is, but when uh, men dress up or, or uh, put on the high heel shoes and walk through the, the streets of towns and, and raise money, it's like just walking in her shoes, uh, seeing things through other people's eyes. And when I was the head scout with Hockey Canada, I always used to say that, that uh, I wanna hear everybody's opinions because I wanna see it through your eyes. And I want to get back in the stands and watch that player through your eyes before I before I make a comment about what I'm seeing or where I'm seeing it. Um, you know, and just a little bit so that you know uh, you know who I am, uh, where I grew up. You heard Matt say I grew up in Oyen, which a lot of you may know is right along the Saskatchewan Alberta border. Uh, and this was how we gave directions and how we got to places as we were growing up. Um, and my dad was a power lineman, and he would always throw in, you know, and just turn at the correction line. And I think I was 30 years old before I figured out what the correction line was. Um, but anyway, you know, that's, that's where I come from. I'm, I'm, I'm small town. My, my family were farmers um, and uh, my mom was a nurse and my dad worked for, used to be Alberta Power, now Atco Electric. And that, you know, that, that's how I grew up. This is, it's a bit foggy, but you can see it's, it's full of glass ceilings. And you can't really see what the gentleman on the, on the second layer is saying, but he's saying, come on up. And there's a female standing there on that glass ceiling. She's broke through one layer of glass ceilings thinking, you know, I've got there. And then she looks up and there's so many more. And, you know, little did I know growing up in Oyen that, that I would have a permanent uh, concussion from trying to break through glass ceilings over time. Uh, and, and really that's what everybody on this call hopefully is, is striving to, to to help women and help people of color, or diversity needed um, to be able to break through glass ceilings and, and experience the, the outstanding opportunities that young men and, and uh, uh, young male hockey players and coaches ha have experienced. So, you know, the glass ceiling is real. 
it's there. And at times, if you're not in a certain, uh, not a certain gender from a certain population, you wouldn't understand what that means. You know, one of the things that uh, you really have to look at is why, why do you need to grow female leadership? Why do we even need to, to worry about these things and, and to talk about them? And, and really those, it's the same question you need to ask yourself when you, you get into coaching or you take a job or, or you're a parent um, or a leader in your community on a board, like, why am I doing that? And you really have to think about why you're doing that. Cause that certainly drives the core of your decision-making the core of what you support and the core of, of how things happen. So when you look at this picture here, you know, why do I do it? These are, these are my two of my great nephews. And, and, you know, my hope is for them that they get to enjoy a game that I loved as well. And that they, they learn that, that women can do things, can do the same type of things as men can do. And that they learn that it doesn't matter whether you're a male or a female, but, if you can make me a better person, if you can ensure I have fun, if you can protect me and keep a safe environment, then I want you to be part of my growth and I want you to be part of my environment. And the same with this young girl. We want her to be able to look and see young boys play the game. My coach is my mom. My coach is a, a, a midget player. Sorry, they're not midgets anymore. U18 player, U17 player that I can be that someday. I never had that opportunity. I never saw a female coach. Cripe, I had to be in my mid twenties before I even knew that, that women coached, but we want her to be able to see all aspects of the game. And, you know, this is a real proud moment for us in women's hockey. Um, you know, three female coaches, three former players, and those are the gold, silver and bronze medalist head coaches at the Canada winter games that were held in Red Deer. And I think the, the importance of that, that if you can see it, you can be it. And I'm sure people are probably tired of hearing that, but, it, but it's so true because those three would have grown up with limited exposure to female coaches as well. And, uh, but it does really come back to the why. Why are each of you on this call? Why is it important that my great nephew see women in leadership roles? Why was it important for Carla and Delaney and Noemi to to, uh, to coach and put in that type of time. And, and why is it important for little Kinsley here to, uh, to be able to see uh, women in roles of leadership and to be able to be to that point where she can aspire to win a gold medal as a young player. It's not about putting a token girl or a token female on the bench. And I, I really have to put that up because I see it way, way, way too much where uh, a young woman a mom, whoever it might be, joins a coaching staff, is part of a staff, and, and all I see them doing is filling the water bottles, um, taking care of all the logistics, because the, the gentlemen on the staff, they just hold out long enough that the, that the female takes it over to make sure it gets done. So it can't be about a token, a token female, and we're way past any of, any of that in terms of, of the talents that we have. And I know growing up, you know, I always admired Saskatchewan in terms of the, the number of girls I saw playing hockey, the number of girls I saw playing fastball and the type of talent that was there. So, you know, there, for me, there's no excuses in, in, in any province, but in Saskatchewan, I, I know the type of talent of the generations that went through and there's so much there. You know, the right hand pitcher, it's about the obstacles in place and and I mean, I can attest to so many of those obstacles. When I tried to do my high performance one, I was told by the people in Alberta that women didn't need to have that level because there was never going to be that level of coaching. And I love Hockey Alberta. And luckily I had a friend that worked for Hockey BC that invited me over there to do my HP one at that point in time, because I couldn't get any coaching positions with Hockey Canada if I didn't have an HP one. And, and so many obstacles that way. I'm not saying it's easy for gentlemen. I, I really, I'm really not, because there comes a time in, in any profession or in any world where everything evens out and, and you're, you're on the same playing field in a lot of cases. But there are a ton of obstacles and a ton of challenges. Um, part of my job with Own the Podium right now is uh, women's high performance, uh, our high performance advisor, and I have women's basketball. You know, and we have a, uh, they have a player returning after giving birth in March, trying to come back to play in the Olympics, you know, put a, 
name a gentleman that that would have to worry about whether his Olympic dream would be on hold because he had a baby in March. The family had a baby in March. So there are so many other challenges there, but you know, we're well beyond being a token girl or a token female on a bench. Uh, there's so much more there that can be given. You know, the double standard is something I really, really need to address or talk about. And, and I, I wanna try to keep it as positive as possible, but I still hear it, see it and live it. And, uh, you know, it's, there's a double standard out there about what's expected of women and what, uh, and what men, what, what is expected of men and, and what women can do and what men can do. And there's also women who have the same double standard for other women and how we treat each other and, and how we grow. I know I coached, I coached more male hockey than I coached female hockey. And I really struggled at times with women's hockey because it was so hard to maintain respect levels and, and be able to, to coach a group of women and not be raked over the coals every day of the, of the practices. And I see Colleen laughing and I, I had the pleasure of coaching Colleen. It was a tough gig and I could go coach men's hockey and it was, it was fun. You know, but they both had their ups and downs. I'm not going to say one's better than the other. That's for sure. Um, you know, this part really drives me nuts. And, and I really want you, if you're a gentleman on the call, I want you to really think about the days you sat in boardrooms or around tables and, and, and a woman was speaking or, or uh, uh, addressing something and, and you, didn't, you didn't really go to the fact, well, she's a pretty good leader, you know. Her, her viewpoints, her comments are great. I guarantee you a lot of you went to, man, she's bossy. She talks way too much. You know, I wish she'd get to the point versus looking at it as good leadership skills there, good courage to speak up. So, I, you know, I really challenge on, on that as well. And this one is interesting. This comes right from within your own province uh, in the last month in an answer to a survey on mentoring. i the, the question is about mentoring. It says, I believe so, but in smaller centers, it's difficult finding the right people. A lot of volunteers coach for their kids' best interests, and you have to let them because they at least know something about hockey. Unlike the divorced single mother smoking crack every other day who wants to volunteer. Like, are you kidding me right now? No, number one, the, the, impl or the inference that the volunteers are all dads who coach for their kids' best interests, and then to single out a divorced single mom like let's let's just start talking about how it there's a double standard there that that would be a response to a survey on coaching and mentoring um and it, it just it's so sad to see that you know these are some of the other things that i've encountered um and you know the one that i the second one there he knows what he wants and she's a bitch i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna really hit that one Years and years ago, um, I used to be a group lead. I used to do group leading for high performance one courses. Really enjoyed it, loved it. I was a student of the game. I wanted to learn. And when you completed your, your coaching levels, all of a sudden you realize I don't get to go to any more webinars or seminars. So you come back and volunteer as a, as a, a group leader. And I, I, I enjoyed it, I loved it. I came to Saskatchewan and it was the worst experience of my life. I had a group of gentlemen who uh, I'm not really sure what their why was on coaching other than wanting to party, drink and hang out. I would be worried about their treatment of kids and, and the seriousness. And I take working with people's children very seriously. And throughout that, um, in trying to get them to, to set a standard and understand the responsibilities, in my opinion, that a high performance coach should have, they proceeded to, uh, get together and tell me what a bitch I was and that uh, it was ridiculous that I was asking them to do this type of work. It was, it was the worst experience of my life. And I swore I would never come back to Saskatchewan and do anything ever again. Um, Joel has cured me of that as has Colleen and Sarah and many other people. But you know, at that point in time, I didn't think I was an expert in any means. I had high standards. I, I really valued what coaches could bring in the environment they could, they could, um, could put uh, young, do for young kids. And I wanted to make sure anybody that I was responsible for um, in that, at that level understood that. And uh, man, it was, a, it, it was, and I'd never ever been treated like that before in the game. 
Um, so it was really challenging. I'd been to two or three world championships. I had an Olympic gold medal under my belt. Um, it wasn't like I just walked off the redneck farm and, and was trying to, to uh, and I, I call myself a redneck Albertan. So um, was trying to, to do anything there. Um, the part about needing time off to have a family, that one irks me. I'm in, in so many conversations where I, candidates are being talked about or decided on. And I hear so many times, well, you know, she's just got married. She's probably going to start a family. Like, do we really want to invest there? Uh, all of those types of things. So, you know, I really would just like check your double standards and really think about, uh, you know, what you do and, and how you come across to your kids, to other young women. My final comment on this is there's a book out there called, um, it's an older book. She's a, she's a slut and he's a stud and 49 other double standards that every woman should know. And a number of years ago at a Hockey Canada um, women's camp, at the beginning of our August camps, we always do a big pile of staff professional development. So I thought, I, I thought I'd try this. I printed off a number of the chapters and just at each table was, you know, men and women, uh, doctors, coaches, massage, therapists, equipment, everybody spread out. And um, I gave them each a chapter to read and discuss. And, and it, it took on a whole life of itself. A number of our, our young staff, young male staff were, were just appalled and upset. And I remember one of them saying to them, I mean, do you think, do you think my sister has been treated like this? Like, do you think, like, they hadn't really ever thought of it. And it really just reinforced for me that we got to continue to have conversations and we have to continue to look at things through other, others' eyes. So, you know, enough on the harsh, tough things, but there, there really is difficulties out there. And for everybody on the call, you have an opportunity to influence positively the experience of the next female coach, the next young girl, the next, uh, the next woman that you encounter in the game. Like you, you have that opportunity and you have that choice. You know, this part here, I know you're, you're talking a lot about mentorship, and I think these are really important that you think along two lines, mentorship and sponsorship. So, you know, mentorship it really can sit at any level. It doesn't matter who it is. It could be, I know my dad goes to the coffee shop in Oyen, and sometimes you can get some pretty good mentorship from that group of men that sit there and gossip and talk and uh, some of their opinions. Um, they provide emotional support, feedback, advice. They help you to navigate. This is out of a business text here, but help you navigate the politics of the world you're entering. You know, strive to increase sense of competence and self worth, and then focus on personal and professional development. Sponsorship is really what I had in my career. So many times I got asked the question, like, who is your mentor, Mal? Who did you, you know, well, there was no other females. And I wouldn't consider the dads that drank while we were coaching hockey, my mentors um, and the people I partied with, I wouldn't consider them my mentors, but sponsorship really was a big part of my, of my career, right from as a recreation director in Castor, Alberta, and one of my team managers in hockey walking in and saying, I got you a gig with the junior B team in Stetler for next year. And me going, well, Glenn, why would I need that? What do I got to go to? You're not going to get where you want to be, Mel, if you just keep coaching midget D here in Castor. Like, you you know, junior B is the next best level in our area. You need to you need to start coaching in that area. Like, I never went looking for it. I never would. Um, another one, the Alberta Cup in, in Alberta. You know, I told the kind of the crappy story about Hockey Alberta. And then, you know, years later, um, I get a call that I'm on a, a U16 Alberta Cup uh, coaching staff. And I'm like, I never applied for a, a coaching staff with the Alberta Cup. No, you never, you should have. We put you on a staff. Like you need to get this experience. So, you know, I was really fortunate on the sponsorship side and the number of, of real good men in my life as I grew up through the ranks and who looked after me. And, you know, I see that protect their protégés from negative publicity. When I started coaching my brother's team, I think it was in grade eight. I had no idea I wasn't supposed to coach. I had no idea people didn't want me there. And I look back now on the dads that, that looked after me and made sure I didn't, I didn't hear any of that. I didn't have to worry about it. It wasn't uh, anything, you know, the people who, ha who have knocked down barriers to get, to get me opportunities or open doors for me. And, you know, so there's two sides of, 
of the mentorship, the sponsorship, and what that looks like. You know, and I, we look at this picture here, who would you want? Who do you want to coach your team? And I don't want you to think about it. I just want you to look at it and say, well, who would I want to coach my team? You know, really, really look at it. And how many of you legitimately chose the three women on the left-hand side versus the young man on the right, right-hand side? You know, and I think the, the piece that I really want to get across here is that, you know, leadership doesn't have a look. So the gentleman on the right hand side is, is a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Philwich. I might be pronouncing that wrong, but he, he played, he had a cup of coffee in the NHL. He played in the WHL. Um, he was just chosen here in March on an NHL teacher award. He's a school teacher now in Manitoba um, as, as the teacher of the year through that, that category. The people on the right, hopefully the women in the group know who they are. Sarah Nurse, Bridget Lequette and Hannah Bunton Olympians, U18 world champions, NCAA champions, uh, club champions. Bridget won a SO Cup the first time it ever ever was played for the U18s. You know, the international experience and the experience that these three women have doesn't even come close, or the, what the gentleman has doesn't even come close to what these three women. But how many of you legitimately chose the women as the ones you would want to coach your young son or your young daughter? Um, so, you know, real important for me, like leadership doesn't have a look. It's about giving opportunities and, and building strong staffs that can bring a number of, of, of pieces together. One other little piece just, just on this was I, uh, the NHL Coaches Association. And if you haven't heard of that, you should Google it or look it up, NHLCA. Um, they implemented a mentorship program this last year. So what they did in every, every NHL city across is they identified, I got people to help them identify one female coach and they paired that female coach up with a, a male pro coach. And there was development opportunities for all of that. And I did a, a session with them about a month ago and we were talking about, um, you know, coaching in the men's game and coaching in the women's game and how many of them had applied for a, to coach in the, in the men's game. And these are, mo for the most part, aren't beginning coaches. They're head coaches in NCA programs. They're successful international coaches. And there was only like eight or nine that had ever applied to coach a male team. Like the confidence level of a, of a, of a woman and, and, and what we all apply for and what we'll go after, you know, we need some prodding and we need some pushing. And generally we won't apply for a job unless we can check all the boxes. And, you know, one of the interesting scenarios for me was around the 2014 Olympics when we were, um, uh, we made a coaching change and, and sort of in that time when the word came out, we were going to make a change to, to when we uh, selected Kevin Deneen, you know, I talked to a handful of female coaches and none of them were, every one of them who were more than capable, more than qualified, we're like, Mel, I'm not, I'm not ready. I need more time. And I had peewee men's coaches, boys coaches, sending their resumes to me that they could coach. They were ready to coach the Olympic team at the, at the Sochi games. So, you know, and I, maybe they were, I don't know, but I just found it so ironic that women that, that were ready to do that didn't think they were. And, and U13, U11 coaches thought they were ready to coach uh, at an Olympic games. Uh, so whether that's confidence, cockiness, whatever it might be, you know, there needs to be a push there, but it doesn't have a look. And I think, you know, this picture kind of, kind of warrants that. And just a sidebar conversation or a sidebar on Jonathan, you know, I read the article when he got the award and the reporter hadn't done his homework either. So just to show it happens both ways, sometimes the final question he had for Jonathan was like, you know, if you could play in the NHL, which team would you play for? And he was like, oh, I did play for the NHL. I played for Pittsburgh. <laughs> and I guess the reporter was a little bit sheepish uh, after that, not knowing that. Um, so just to wrap it up, you know, always work hard. You never know who you're inspiring. I, I mean, the hard work is so important, but you never know who you're inspiring is, is crucial. And the ability for a young girl to look out there and see other young girls on the ice, I, I think is so important. It's important for players to see women on the bench and women as leaders. And then for the, for the women in the group, you know, why not me? Why not now? 
Like there never is a good time. And that, that group of uh, NHL coaches, association coaches that I spoke to on the, the females within that, I asked them what they thought the number one trait was that they brought to the, um, what they would bring to a team. And interestingly enough, not one of them said anything technically, tactically. Every one of them talked about how relationships, they build, bring relationship building, they bring communication, they bring a number of pieces. And I really challenged them to say that that's a given. If you really want to succeed, then sell yourself on what you can bring on the ice. Because every one of them could go up against anybody's power play or penalty kill or five on five system. Yet that wasn't the strength they saw that they brought to the team. So just a, a real important piece for me that we, everybody brings a different piece to the team and the importance of, of bringing that all together. And, you know, maybe one coaching staff member needs a little bit more of a softer sell, sell and needs to understand, you know, relationships and, Maybe somebody brings more on the tech tack, but the importance of learning from each other to be able to grow the number of coaches we have, male and female, is, is crucial. And I applaud, you know, Saskatchewan Hockey for for putting this the the piece in place they have about having a female on the bench. It's sad that you have to put it as a policy or a rule so that it has to happen. But the fact that it's going to happen, I think you're only going to see some great things down the road, and it's going to. Uh, really bring about strong role models and strong pieces for your young female athletes and for young girls across across your province. So with that, I'll stop my share and open it up for questions, however you want to do this, uh, Matt. Oh, that's great. Thanks a lot, Mel. What a great presentation. Um, so if you guys have any questions or comments for Mel, we will do those right now. If you feel comfortable in speaking your question, you may do so. Um, if you don't want to speak your question, just type it in the chat box and I will read it. Uh, just before we get to the questions with Mel, I apologize. I missed uh, two board members, uh, Jeannie Gilchrist and Trevor Norum. So I apologize to you two. Uh, so yeah, let's get to the questions with Mel. Don't be shy. Well, either they're tired of me now or uh, it only I takes covered, one I covered it off. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Oh, go. go ahead, Jordan. Okay. My question was just around the token female, I guess, like what is uh, one major beneficial way that we can ensure either that we are becoming the token female or that somebody else isn't being treated that way too? Well, anytime you go into a situation, you want to make sure you really de define out who's doing what. And the last thing anybody ever picks up is, uh, um, you know, logistics or the token female duties, if you will. So I think it's real important that any staff you go into, you talk about who's covering off what. And for women, um, I think you have to be patient that another staff member might not do it the way you would do it or as efficiently as you would do it or as quickly as you would do it and hold yourself back from jumping in. Because as soon as you jump in and take something over, if it's a duty that somebody doesn't really want to do, then it's going to be yours for keeps. So uh, I think patience, patience along that way. And then for, for other people, it's the same type of thing, like help them to find out quickly, like what's my role, who's looking after what, um, and don't leave things to chance that you're going to have to clean up on the back end. And uh, then it just becomes automatic that Jordan looks after that. Mel, we do have a question in the chat box. Uh, in the Hockey Canada forum over the weekend, there was a thought that maybe HC mandates a female on every age division, male bench as well. Thoughts? And then she says, I 100% agree and truly dislike the token female attitude. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think female bench is the first step, number one. Um, you know, some some women don't want to don't want to coach guys. They don't want to be a part of it. And some don't just like some girls don't want to play with boys. And that's sometimes why you can't get young girls out. They'll get out for come out for a, a women's team. So I think it's more about us taking ownership and responsibility for developing the people within our within our communities, within our associations um, and providing opportunities. So if the, 
if, if, if somebody wants to coach on a male team, I think they should be given that opportunity for sure. I mean, like I said, I coached more male teams than I did female teams, but I think it's hard to continue to mandate everything. Um, and are there enough women to go around to fill all those spots? Like uh, women aren't necessarily as crazy as men in terms of how much time they want to spend in the rink and, and how much they want that to take up their lives. And I've seen that when I've tried to find women that, that on the scouting side and the number of them that have gone through it and say to me like, Mel, I'm not that crazy. I can't sit in the rink like you can. I, I can't sit there all day. So I think it's a good thought, but I really would hope that we can, we can get to that point where it's a natural evolution that if a, a woman wants to coach on, on, in the male game, she'll be involved at that level. If she wants to coach on the female side, she'll be involved at that level. I always worry. And I mentioned this at the, in the NHLCA group, I did that, uh, you know, we see, um, I, I understand in football and, and uh, baseball, you know, there's a lot of women going in there and coaching, but there's not sometimes the same equivalent. But when we lose coaches to the male game or we lose athletes to the male game, you know, it, it, it hurts our side as well on the female side. Then, we, you know, we lack depth and we lack talent there. So it's a fine line. It's a good thought. I hope we can get to a point where we don't have to mandate anybody anywhere that it's, it's happening uh, naturally and organically. Great. That was from Sarah McNaught, by the way. Um, there's another one from Memory Williamson. I'm not sure. She just says, also have a question in regards to coaching interviews. I'm not sure if she wants to elaborate on that, Memory, or... Yep, you bet. Hi, Matt. Hi, Mel. Hi. Uh, sorry. Uh, my question is kind of a little bit to do with... Um, I've been through quite a few coaching interviews in regards to, you know, your comments about selling yourself and what are your strengths? And I think I do maybe not the best job, but um, decent at that. And I, I struggle with, you get up um, with interviewers that are, you know, fixated on, on the technical stuff, which, okay, that's fine. But if you haven't played junior A yourself or something, it's almost like whatever you say really is of no value. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. I think there's, you know, there needs to be some balance there as to what, again, what staffs need. So I, you know, I don't know that you as a, a coach being interviewed can do a lot about that, but, you know, board associations and, and minor hockey associations can really look at what is it that you want on a coaching staff and how are you going to find the balance for what you need um, and, and what that looks like. And then that should help guide you know, guide the interview process. I'm, I'm right in the middle right now of doing a number of interviews for a national team head coach. So I'm on this committee. And the one note that I wrote um, down here is that another double standard that came out in some of these interviews is that when, when a man brings in outside expertise, they're perceived as leaving no stone unturned and surrounding themselves with all the right people. And when a woman does the same thing, she's perceived as not knowing what she's doing. So, you know, within that, the coaching realm of it, I think the associations have to make sure they have a good sense of how they want to put their staffs together and what that looks like. So I, I'm sorry you've gone through that me memory for sure. I think all you can do is continue to answer the questions and, and board members you need to make sure you're really clear on what you need in your staffs and that it's not just about the player uh, and, the, and the background, although there needs to be some mix of that in there. Great, thanks a lot. Anybody else have anything for, for Mel? Um, what do you think will be the biggest step that we're gonna have to take to get those families with the younger females to, and especially their parents, to see that female hockey can become more competitive instead of just going right to male hockey and not giving it a chance, to make them see that they're gonna be the future, that, that progresses female hockey to become more competitive at that younger age, I guess. Um, like I know I've heard ideas about asking those girls to play not only on that male team, but on a female team as well. Um, obviously they're gonna have to get more people to do scheduling and stuff like that, but what do you think is gonna have to be done? Well, it certainly is. I know in, in rural Alberta, uh, it certainly is a challenge probably from U13 down because you know, it's sort of that area that physiological changes aren't as, as adamant, aren't as big. 
uh, the, the, the socialization pieces aren't as big either. Uh, it's more so when you hit the U15 uh, age groups that you're starting to see those, those bigger changes and, and that's too late in small communities to get you know girls teams or women's teams going. So you know if, if you're able to do the double, I guess it's the double carding or team sheeting or whatever it's called now, I don't know for sure, where, where young girls can play with other young girls and, and, and both sides of it, I think that's important. I really believe it, it's incredibly important for the organization in Saskatchewan hockey to, to ensure that the pathway for a female is well outlined and provided in all the associations. I, I hear I'm involved in so many discussions when the players get to the, to the age group, I think it's U15 when they're drafted for the Western Hockey League or whatever, and young girls have played up to that point and they, they think they'll get drafted and that's not their pathway, unfortunately. You know, and I don't say unfortunately as a negative, there's a whole other pathway out there on the women's side that they're not even aware of and they're, they're caught up in the, the male players pathway and what it looks like and they don't have a sense of what it looks like on the female side and, and how many opportunities there are for academics and athletic scholarships and U16 and U18 uh, women's teams and the development side of it and the senior national team. So I think, you know, making sure that equal or more time is spent on educating parents and, and, and young girls as to the pathways. I, Brooklyn, I think it's really tough on the up to the U13 because of the fact that even in smaller centers, you need the girls to make the team. If the girls go and play girls hockey, then they, there's no team. So continuing to build that out and, and help them understand the enjoyment of that dressing room setting with other girls. And it, you know, right around that U13 time, it should, it should, uh, should merge hopefully. I do think it's really important though for the younger age group because there's so many girls that want to play with other girls and being able to put that together and being flexible in boundaries and, and how you move that together. And it, it's not an easy puzzle to put together, but I do think it's manageable, but it involves people talking and, and, and thinking about the best interests of the, of the young players. Now I have another uh, couple questions in the chat box here. For male or female head coaches, what are some behaviors that can help create a good learning environment for a new female assistant coach? What are some behaviors that might undermine that coach's development? Well, again, responsibilities, um, you know, don't like through my whole career, other than when I coached my brother's team, I was on a lot of male staffs and they didn't know what to do with me. Our male teams and the staffs, they didn't know what to do with me. I had to find my own way. I figured it out by doing one-on-ones and giving, giving feedback, but you know, really be intentional in the guidance you're going to give them. What role are they going to play? Um, giving them direction during drills, what you want them to see or comment on or, or um, uh, you know, work on with the player. Do in the station work. Um, hopefully you're doing lots of small area stuff and station work. Giving them stations to run and helping them grow in that. If they're, if they're not overly comfortable, you know, helping them build that confidence, start the, start the station, give a few teaching points, go to the other end and let them run it and let them show that they can do it. But you can't leave them on their own. You have to, you have to have a plan for their development and you, you have to invest in it. You, you want, you have to want them to be better and to help them grow. It, it's, uh, it's not, uh, it's not just about having a female on the staff. And I would say with, with any staff member, I said, you know, right now, my mom could go out and coach like there's so many drills online and she can read as well as anybody else and she can blow a whistle she probably wouldn't even need a whistle. Um, you know, she can, she can do that like anybody can run drills, male or female, but teaching and, and getting the most out of, of those drills is important so I think as a staff you have to, you have to really share that and it's not about insecurities or somebody being better than somebody else it's how can we be at our best as a staff so these young people can be at their best as 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 athletes and as as young young hockey players okay perfect we got another one here what advice would you give a female head coach in regards to being selected or considered as a head coach for a female hockey by their local association in comparison to the male counterparts 
just believe in yourself. Um, I mean, that's a really good question. Believe in yourself and, and find a, find a team manager that's going to protect you. That's going to look after you find the, find the father or the mother that's going to cause the most trouble if they don't have a role, put them in the team manager role and get them to look after everything on that end for you. I did that a lot as a rec director. Um, I always, I didn't have any parents coaching as a rec director, but I had the honoriest team managers and those young guys and girls just got to coach. They didn't have to worry about dealing with the other pieces. And then the second thing I would say is if you're a female head coach, find another female and, and, and have a second one and find another good, a third good coach, male or female. And I would challenge young, I would challenge men that as well. Like lots of times gentlemen coach because they're, their neighbor, their kids are playing together. So they're, they, they coach together, they're buddies, they have fun. Like I would challenge you to find a couple of, of young females that you're gonna, you're gonna help grow and bring on board and, and help get them ready to be able to take over their teams as well. So we all have a stake in it. Um, I was just, I was asking, I was thinking back to your mentorship and sponsorship slide. Yeah. And yeah. I think that we've kind of, by, by ensuring that there's a female on the, on the bench, we've kind of done that sponsorship. We're sponsoring the females, but now, I think we might have some MHAs on the, on the call wondering, okay, well, what am I going to, how am I going to go from here to make sure that I can fill the roles with females and that when we do that, we can provide mentorship for them so that they're, we don't have this tokenism that we've been right. like, talking about. So, I mean, about. there's, there's a lot of ways to do that. There's, there's, you know, making your staffs accountable as to what are the responsibilities and roles going to be and trusting that they are going to be accountable and, and execute that way. There's also the opportunity to bring together the females in your minor hockey association, you know, whether it's once a month or however you want to do it. I think, you know, our video platforms have really opened our eyes as to the, the flexibility we can do that and, and have those discussions, what's working, what isn't working. Um, and it's not about, you know, criticizing somebody they're working with or whatever. It's about, Hey, I'm not alone in this. Like, you know, 50% of our staff still are, are using the token piece. So we, we've really got to work on that or no, we're doing a really good job. You know, my staff, these are my responsibilities and I'm comfortable with that. And, you know, I get to do that. So it's really about sharing that hopefully within the staff, they could, they can share that. But I realize that that takes, you know, a little bit of courage and some trust and, and some, some confidence. So even to be able to bring the people together, a uh, mentor could you just bring the staffs together and talk with each staff as to what's happening, how it, how it's going, and 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 just encourage, um, you know, strong conversations that are in the benefits of growth of everybody. And it, you know, I I know as volunteers in minor hockey associations, it you, you don't go in to coach thinking about the growth of the person next to you or whatever. It's about you know I'm just going to coach my kids' team and have some fun. I love the game. But, you know, we really have to invest in our youth and we have to invest in our communities and, and that's a, a huge part of it as well. Hopefully that helps, Dobby. Anything else for Mel? If no one has any more questions, we will move uh, to our Rico room exercise. Um, each room will have an SHA representative as the moderator. The moderators will be responsible for keeping the group on task and they will record and report the answers back to the whole group. In order to make everyone feel comfortable, we will not record the breakout rooms, so please speak freely. I will now turn it over to Joe and he will get you all uh, split up into a breakout room. Thanks, Matt. Uh, yeah, so as Matt mentioned there, we're gonna we're gonna move into breakout rooms, about seven or eight of us in each uh, breakout room. I'm gonna just open up those rooms very short shortly from now. Um, about two minutes left, you'll see a countdown on the timer. So all the moderators know with that two minutes left, you'll see a countdown. Once that two minutes is up, we'll all return back here to the main room. So I think that's all about it. And uh, yeah, best luck in your rooms here.
Welcome back, everybody. Uh, so we will go through each of the breakout rooms. Uh, let's start with Joel Hausman and Sarah Hodge's room. Your question was, come up with three ways that a minor hockey association could recruit new female coaches. Joel, we will start with you. Sure. Our, uh, our group came up with, uh, with the three things that we had was one, to, to host some uh, female only coaching clinics within your minor hockey. So just making sure it's hundred percent only females. So new coaches feel more comfortable to come out. Uh, two was uh, get, get somebody within the minor hockey association to contact uh, uh, female coaches individually rather than um, throw out a mass email, or put a poster up in a rank, somebody that's more boots on the ground that can go through your minor hockey associations, maybe, you know, roster years past and, and try and look at, at people that have gone through your system that may want to get back involved in the coaching side of the game. And then uh, the third idea we had was making a, a clear plan on, on the, on what the year looks like and, and what is all involved with coaching the team, how many ice times, you know, what the time commitment is, what your role in the team is, uh, the support systems you might have in place in terms of here's our coaching resource, here's our coaching coordinator, here's our mentor, uh, you know, all those number of things kind of laid out in a package. Uh, so when, when somebody signs up, they know what they're signing up for. That's great. Uh, now to Sarah's room, do you have anything uh, extra to add? Yeah, I, we got lots. Um, I'll start with a positive. Uh, we had one group member who has a five-year gap between their children and has noticed a pretty big difference between her oldest and her youngest with the number of female coaches that they're coming across. So um, she's noted that we're making progress. So I think that's a really good thing. We were predominantly female in our room. And the first point was just being role models. And I think we were all managing or coaching and then just sticking with it and making sure people can see us in, in those coaching positions. Along with that, making sure we are using the women who we have coaching or working in our organizations to shoulder tap other women because we, women's hockey world is probably smaller than the hockey world is and we all know it's small. So um, they will likely know other women who have played in the past and might have an interest. Um, we had a young woman who's just 17 in our group and she wants to get coaching. And so I think it'd be huge to tap into that age group. We need to recruit them coming right out of under 18 and make sure that we can keep them involved in the game because they want to, and we can't lose them <laughs> before they're, they're to get into other things. Um, and then the final point, um, that came up on the con the summit on Sunday with the hockey Canada summit was just that there's a lot of other staffing opportunities within hockey. I think it was mentioned that there's 35 staff members with a national team. So there's opportunities in massage therapy and athletic therapy, all kinds of different things. And just making sure that we're exposing women to all those things as they get involved. And I forgot one more and it's important. SHA sends a female goalie coach out to the different areas to do some coach mentorship. And that is very much appreciated. And that's it. That's great. Good information. Uh, we will now go to Blaine Stork and Robin Ulrich's room. Your question was, what are three qualities that make a good coach mentor? And do the qualities differ from a male mentor to a female coach or a female mentor to a male coach? Why or why not? Blaine, I will start with you. Okay. Um, some of the qualities we had for a, a good coach mentor were uh, to be a good listener, um, to never, never assume what the coach knows, uh, to create a safe environment, uh, to be an excellent communicator, uh, to create clear expectations or goals for your coach, and to have... Um, to have the coach know that you, that that coach has your, uh, the mentor is backing that coach through thick or thin. Um, we just, we only dabbled in the other two parts of that question, Matt. Uh, so we, I don't really have much to report on that. So I'll okay. leave that to Robin. I know Robin's group is going to do that one. Okay. Yeah. Robin, would you have uh, anything to add? 
Uh, the only other piece we'd probably add on the uh, the first part for the qualities is the ability to give constructive criticism um, and making sure that there are takeaways for the coach so that they can continue to develop um, because uh, just getting compliments and being told that you're doing a good job um, doesn't help, you know, kind of push you along. And um, the couple that uh, shared some experiences with coach mentors said they really liked uh, when they were given, you know, little tweaks and drills and little things to think about. So it doesn't have to be anything that's uh, big life changing or game changing. It might just be those little pieces to help them help them along. Um, and number two, we didn't talk about too much other than, you know, ideally there shouldn't be any differences, but there may be um, maybe some differences uh, specifically in the female mentor to male coach um, area, but uh, we didn't get too far into that. That's great. Thank you. Uh, the next one is mine and Dina Jelena's room. Our question was, we were to come up with three ways uh, a minor hockey association could retain female coaches. Um, my room will go first. We came up with mentorship as number one, and then MHA support and guidance. Uh, just make it a little clear on you know how to get clinics and and what they can what they need for certifications. And then the third one was uh, being able to attend all female coaching clinics. I think that was. Uh, it's a pretty important one in our group. So, uh, Dina, do you have anything to add? Uh, just a couple of things to tag along. Uh, we also had the key one of support. Uh, same thing, support from the MHAs, but also supporting females in leadership roles and having and fostering relationships with the other females that coach uh, in your area or in your MHA. Um, even if it was just developing a network with those females just to kind of talk about the things that are going well or not. Uh, just bounce ideas off of each other. So that was one. Um, and then kind of had, you, you might have an easier time retaining female coaches if we can recruit them at a younger age. You know, if we get females involved at the U7 or U9 level, um, it's less intimidating for them to be involved there and then tag them with a more experienced coach where they can learn the tech tack of the game and, and it's not such an intimidating experience for them. Great, good job. And finally, the last two rooms, Brenda Cromarty and Colleen Sistorics. Your question was, list three ways a head coach can help mentor a brand new female coach during a season. Brenda, we will start with your room. Oh, I was hoping you'd start with Colleen's. Come on now. Sorry. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, basically, we come across that submitting the year plan, the coaches and the whole staff would have to sit down together and have a progressive plan that uh, would start with the expectations of each staff. In, in turn, then they would show empowerment by giving roles and responsibilities to each and then build on that. Uh, collaboration through uh, the physical, technical and the mental part of the, the game so that everyone would have a role and responsibility of that. Um, to get back, to make sure that everything is, is progressing fine is to have regular basis of feedback uh, to make sure that the head coach is available and approachable uh, and uh, at the beginning I missed that part is to ask the uh, assistant coach what expectations she has in her role where does she want to be what is her interest and then also as the head coach, his responsibility is to say to the all staff members what they expect from him and what how he can support or she can support the rest of the staff. Um, so basically your year plan beginning so that again, I said, start so that you can empower everybody through the roles and responsibilities, uh, collaboration through everybody and feedback, whether it's negative, positive, and build on that. That's great. That. That's great. Colleen, do you have anything? Brenda's group did, uh, did a really great job. They covered off uh, most things that we had, but um, one of them that I wanted to say again, because I think it's really important and it came up in ours is to have that coach meeting it was even thrown out there to have it maybe as a coach party, but I mean, I'll leave that up to you guys. Um, <laughs> so that where you get to know each other a little bit and then um, to actually have that question where you ask 
what, um, what roles they feel comfortable in and what roles they expect. And then at least you have a starting point where everyone's comfortable. And then as you, um, as you, as the leader see where they're able to take more, more responsibilities, you can build on that throughout the year um, to have those clear roles and practices um, to, to give everyone a role, um, making sure that there's those roles and practices um, and giving them an opportunity to explain at the board. Don't just uh, head coach, take over the reins all the time. Make sure that you give the, the assistant coach a, a chance to be, to be seen and heard from the, from the team so that maybe you don't have those formal, formal, formal divisions between the, the levels of, of coaches say. Um, and, and I guess the, the only other thing that we mentioned that, that she didn't, um, the, the roles and the responsibilities that was, that was clear is um, be an ally to that coach. Um, so you're a mentor, but you're also an ally. So um, make sure that you're, you're the one who can, can correct people if they're, they're, there's something negative being said about that coach or um, whether you're fe female or male, you can be an ally to that, um, to that young, young person and, and help them out around your MHA. That's some great information. Thank you. Thank you everybody for participating. Uh, just a reminder, I will be sending out a survey which will allow you the opportunity to answer all four of the questions that we just went through. Um, so does anybody have any last questions, comments, discussion, anything you'd like to add? Matt, if I could, I just want to congratulate all of you for being here. It's, uh, you know, I think there was 65, 68 at the top of the the show and uh, you know it, it goes a long a long way for what you're going to try to build or what you're building in Saskatchewan so congratulations on giving up a couple hours of your night or an hour of your night to to make the game better that's great so yes I guess this will end our growing female leadership webinar uh, just on behalf of the Saskatchewan Hockey Association I want to say thanks to Melody Davidson Mel it's always a pleasure listening and learning from you uh, and thank you to all our presidents, directors, coordinators, coaches for taking time out of your evening to be with us. Uh, can't thank you enough. Take care, stay safe, and good night.